Good evening, church. Turn with me, if you would, to Daniel chapter 9. <clears throat> we'll be covering the first 19 verses of this chapter tonight, then covering the rest of the chapter the next time we're together. But while you turn there, I'll give you the no-spoilers version of uh, what we're reading tonight, which is uh, this prayer that Daniel has. Um, it's a prayer that comes on the heels of considering the words of Jeremiah the prophet, and it's a prayer of repentance, which highlights God's righteousness and his promise to pour out judgment on his people when they behave unjustly. Um, something I want you guys to keep in mind tonight, early American statesman Daniel Webster uh, is quoted to uh, respond, quote it is, uh, is quoted to having responded to the question, there we go, that's what I'm trying to say, what is the most sobering thought that ever entered your mind? To which he responded, my greatest thought is my accountability to God. With that in mind, we'll be looking at this prayer in Daniel in light of the situation that put the Israelites in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, and now under Darius the Mede, and eventually under Cyrus the Persian in the first place. So if you would please stand, if you're able, as I read from the inspired, infallible, inexhaustible riches of God's word. Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books... The number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. <clears throat> I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments... We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, and all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame. To our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of our Lord. Our God, by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us, because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been anything or there's not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. <clears throat> As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who, has, uh, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake, O Lord. Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is, which is desolate. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God because your city and your people are called by your name. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the opportunity to study this prayer, this opportunity to gather together and to sit under the authority of your word. <clears throat> God, would you open us up? Would you open our ears, unplug them, unclog them, help us to block out everything else that's going on and hear from you tonight? That we can go from here knowing that you have spoken and knowing what a path forward looks like for each one of us as we live our lives. Father, I love you. I thank you for giving us your word. I thank you for including us in your kingdom and in your plans. We give this time to you as an offering. And we ask you to accept it and help us to offer it with a humble and sincere heart. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Look, it's, it, <laughs> it's been a heavy week. Uh, I mean, there's a lot going on um, from a, another school shooting, from a supermarket shooting, from senseless violence seemingly erupting all around us, um, to the guidepost report on the Southern Baptist Convention Executive Committee's handling of sexual abuse reporting. There is a lot to be grieving about in our country these days. And we can look at everything and wonder what the answers are, and we rightly should. Um, <clears throat> right now, though, is a time to sit in sackcloth and ashes, to be grieved, to be wrecked by the devastation that we see in the world around us. I know uh, for me, the last several days, my wife can attest to this, have weighed very heavily on me, on my heart and on my mind. And it's interesting because as heavy as it's been, there is nothing that happens in this world anymore that takes me by surprise. Um, there are sins that you cannot believe that are possible in the first place that are happening. Um, there's the slaughter of innocent children in and out of the womb. There are sins and lives cut short by violence in schools and neighborhoods. There is innocent ripped away, innocence ripped away from children and teenagers and even adults at home and in schools and in relationships. And if you can even stomach it in what should be the safest place, the church. And as much as it grieves me, the more I understand about what God's word says about the world, the less surprised I am. My conscience is, is no less shocked. It's not like I'm like, oh, I'm not surprised. But, you know, like, I'm not, I'm, I'm more grieved by every new revelation, by every disclosure of abuse, by every headline that's proclaiming the darkness that we see and closing around us in the world. And every headline that we see that pleads with the government to stop messing around with people's lives and to do the very thing that they're charged to do, which is protect the vulnerable and the innocent in the world. My heart aches, as I'm sure yours does too. Um, and this is where the message gets a little personal, right? The, for me, um, the call to being a pastor is both the easiest and the hardest thing in the world. Um, and particularly in times like these. It's the easiest because I know what the answer is. I know. I know the answer. I do not have to go looking hard to find the answer. I have the greatest news in the world. You have the greatest news in the world. We have the surest hope of hopes in a hopeless world. We do have an answer. We do know why things are the way they are. We do know that the answer is a simple one, even though it is far from easy. The Bible tells us that the unregenerate heart is desperately wicked. Jeremiah writes, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Even the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul writes that the regenerate heart battles a sinful flesh that seeks to carry out its desires. But the answer to all of that is for Jesus to reign. Sounds simple. It sounds easy. And in that respect, the job is easy. I can tell you this message until I'm blue in the face and know that I'm not leading you astray. When Jesus reigns, when he fully reigns, right, we see Revelation 21, all tears, gone, all pain, gone, all heartache, gone, all of those things will be gone. The fighting will cease, the swords will be, ble will be beaten into plowshares. 
the injustice of the world will be dealt with as Jesus will rule with an iron rod. But we're not in those days yet. And so the job becomes considerably harder. The harder part is a pastor is explaining that we have a here but not yet kingdom of God that we're a part of, that we serve a risen Savior, yet the risen Savior has not returned to take up his eternal rule as the King of Kings. This is the hardest part of the job. The answer I can give, the best answer, is not palatable to most people. God in his, in his sovereignty has decided to wait. He's allowed all of the things that we see taking place in our country, across history, and everything else to happen. And so as we get farther and farther from the cross, our accountability wanes because if he didn't come back before the Catholic Church sold indulgences, and he didn't come back before people turned slavery into profit and abuse, if he didn't come back before the Holocaust, if he didn't come back before the United States dropped not one but two atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, if he didn't come back before the genocide allowed by the Supreme Court of the United States through the decision of Roe versus Wade, if he didn't come back before the civil war in the Sudan that's wiped out hundreds of thousands, if he didn't come back before all of these school shootings, if he didn't come back before thousands were sexually abused by Catholic priests, before who knows how many others, children and adults have been abused sexually in churches around the country and around the globe, before, take your pick of whatever you want to say, before this happened, why didn't he come back before? If he's sovereign, and this is why it is hard. As we gain more and more distance from the cross, from Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension, from his promises to come again to reign and rule over everything, we become more calloused to the world around us. We become more and more callous to the word of God that challenges us to live as though the day of the Lord could come tomorrow. That challenges us to face our own self sinfulness in need of a savior. Each day that slides into the past deadens our senses to the truth that each breath is a gift from God to be used in service to him. In short, the most challenging part of being a pastor is how easily we can say Jesus is Lord and yet not treat him as such. We've been redeemed, purchased back from death and hell itself by the blood of the spotless lamb, the incarnate word, the son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. We owe him everything. And generally speaking, we trust him little compared to what is due to him. I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of doing things under my own steam. I am guilty of not pursuing God's wisdom for my life or for my family or even for this church. I readily admit to you that I have failed in so many ways to submit myself to God. And if we're honest with ourselves, we all find ourselves lacking in that area. No one is perfect because we tend toward self-sufficiency. And then we tend to thank God for giving us another day to do what he's called us to do, often doing it under our own power and own steam. And tonight, our passage is in every way, shape, and form providential. We find ourselves on the edge of a drastic shift in the Southern Baptist Convention based on the guidepost report released over the weekend. And if you don't know what that's about, come and talk to me about it and I'll explain it. I won't explain it happily, but I will happily engage in the conversation. What we've seen is God's people not acting in accordance with God's justice, and now we face a judgment. As we look at the text tonight, I want to draw out for you what a heart dedicated to God's reign and rule really looks like. I'm going to show you two marks of a heart that's dedicated to God's reign and rule. One is a heart that's accountable for personal sinfulness. And the other is a heart fully dependent on God's mercy. So let's look at this prayer that we find here in Daniel and see what we see. Firstly, let's deal with this accountability for personal sinfulness. Daniel says over and over, 
All right, I'm just going to skim through here and pull out some phrases that he uses. We have sinned and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets. We have sinned against you. We have rebelled against you and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey, to obey your voice. I read that and I go, now this is, this is Daniel. Have you seen Daniel do any of that? I haven't seen Daniel do any of that, right? This is the guy that's consistently done the right thing, who in the face of difficulties has faithfully chosen not to defile defile himself at the king's table, to seek God's face consistently and pray for answers and guidance and wisdom and not do it under his own steam, to continue in his dedication to serve the Lord rather than men, even when those around him have laid a trap for him. And yet he says, we have sinned. He takes a corporate responsibility before God. He includes himself in the population that has denied God, that's not listened to his servants, the prophets, that has rebelled against God by not heeding his instruction in the law of Moses. Now, looking through the book of Daniel, I see no evidence (laughs) that says that. But I guarantee you, Daniel would know better than you or I. He knows his own heart. I'm, assume, I, I am, I'm assuming here that he knows something that we don't. I think he has a mindset like Paul, who though he had been redeemed, though he tried consistently to honor God, he admits that he hadn't done so perfectly, that there was a war still waged between him and in what he wants to do and what he doesn't want to do, what he knows he should and what he knows he shouldn't. Paul writes about that in the book of Romans. And he often says he finds himself on the wrong side of that predicament. I'm always reminded of this. Alistair Begg once uh, once said that if he really knew the people in his church, he may not want to be their pastor. But if they really knew him, they might not want him to be their pastor. There's something deeply true about what Daniel is saying. It's not quite like he's saying he's a dirtbag, But he is certainly making a statement about the law of God and how he himself has somehow fallen short of it, even though we don't see it. Again, we all do. If we were able to keep God's law perfectly, we wouldn't need Jesus. So there's this open and honest confession, and he confesses on behalf of the entire nation of Israel. Can he do that? I mean, does that work? Can I confess all of our corporate sins before God? Can I confess the hatred that we all have in our hearts collectively, even though we might not realize it? You know, road rage. Can I confess for all of us that we've been greedy, that we've been self-serving, that we've been dishonest, that we've been short-sighted, that we've not shown mercy or compassion that we've not denied ourselves, that we've not lived out our lives as a testimony to the surpassing power and glory of Jesus? Can can I do that? Is is that allowed? Secondly, do I I need to do that? I mean, God's all-knowing, right? Doesn't he know that I've fallen short? That you've fallen short? That we've fallen short? Doesn't he know that? As individuals in a church, haven't we failed at what God has called us to do? I don't care how much spin you put on it. I'm not going to speak for any of you, but I know that I have. Which leads me to assume what I know of the human condition of what we see in the Bible, that if I've done it, you've done it. And I'm even saying that about my wife, who I think is probably the best person I've ever met. She's down there shaking her head because she knows she isn't. If that's what we've done individually, can we honestly say the church has succeeded where we as individuals have failed? Isn't the church, the people, committed to a covenant relationship with one another in a specific cultural context and location rather than merely just an organization or a building? So we have to deal with our sins as individuals for sure, but we also have a responsibility as the body of Christ, right? And that's a, that's a big, deep 
deep issue. That's a deep pool. Remember what I said, being a pastor is easy and hard. I know the answers to all of these questions. It doesn't make it easy to tell you the answer. It doesn't make it easy to help you lead you. It doesn't make it easy to lead you where God wants to take you. In fact, reading between the lines of Daniel's prayer for Israel, it becomes harder as we face down our own responsibility for our own actions. I can barely conform myself to the image of Christ. I can, only, I can barely do that for me. I can't do that for you. Yet somehow, if you're not, and if I'm not, and if your spouses aren't, and if your children aren't, then we have failed utterly. That's what it means to be part of the body. In some way, yes, Daniel can confess this failure. He can take responsibility because he is a child of Israel. He is a part of the corporate fabric of the nation, of the family, so to speak. So he owns it. He owns his part in it by being open about the reality of the struggle against his own sinful heart. The hand doesn't get to say to the eye that it's not needed. There's a body involved here. The sin of one affects the sin of the entire body. So firstly, we need to be open and honest about dealing with our own sin. One of the hardest things, one of the hardest things is to be open and honest and vulnerable about who you really are and what you really struggle with. Because no matter how much we love one another, we're still guarded. We say to ourselves, hey, I don't want anyone to know that I'm having a hard time with, insert your issue here. Because I don't want to be judged. I don't want people to know my sins because they're shameful. Because I know better. Yet, that is the boldness that we need to exhibit with our brothers and sisters. How, if we have a corporate responsibility to hold each other up and to love one another and pray for one another and carry each other's burdens, how in the world can anyone else help with that if we're not open and honest about the burden that we're carrying? How can people come alongside us to hold us accountable for our sins and pray for us if we need it, if we don't even tell them that we need help? It's hard to fight against our own sinful selves and we're not held accountable for someone else's sins. Each one of us is responsible for our own load. But we have a responsibility to help others combat their sins. Your fight is my fight. Because we all are fighting the same fight. You're fighting on a different front than what I'm fighting on. You might not struggle with greed or jealousy or lust. But somebody in this body does. Someone you know who's a Christian does. They're fighting the exact same fight against themselves that you fight in another area. We're all fighting against our flesh and blood and against the devil who wants to ensnare us in our sins. And so we have to stick together in the battle, sticking up for each other in the heat of the moment, intervening and interceding for one another. This is how we battle. And that means together we confess our sins. I confess my sins, you confess your sins, we all confess our sins. You get to confess, and you get to confess, and you get to confess. At the heart of the strategy for winning the battle, though, is the gospel. Because it's admitting that neither you nor I can win the battle. God won that victory once for all time at the cross. There's only ever been one person who can handle the burden of your sins for you, for me, for everyone. And that's the perfect Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. But just because we cannot carry other people's sins doesn't mean we can't support others as they fight their battles. And that requires real, open, honest communication with one another, transparency. It's based in a gospel. It's not a judgy thing. It's realizing that 
Like I said, you got sins, I got sins, we all got sins, but we got a Savior that's greater than all of our sins, and we're all in need of redemption no matter who we are. So your sin may look ugly to you, and my sin may look uglier, but that same sin, regardless of what it is, separates us from God. And the only remedy for that is Jesus. So we need to step in and accept the truth that the sins of the individual are a corporate responsibility. And I know right now you might be uncomfortable with that. That you as a church member are somehow a little bit responsible for someone else's sins. You might be a little, a little uncomfortable with that. And if there's one thing that this week's Guidestone report has reminded me of, it's that dealing with sin is a family affair. In an article on the Gospel Coalition about how Christians and specifically members of Southern Baptist churches should respond to this Guidestone report, Griffin Gulledge writes, In moments like these, we're all tempted to say, this doesn't pertain to me. I'm not an abuser. I've not been abused. No one, it's not going on in my church. This doesn't pertain to me. We're tempted to ask, is that my problem? It's an echo of the excuse spoken east of Eden. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer to that question was always yes. So much mistreatment and abuse has happened because Baptists refuse to look, refuse to learn, and refuse to listen. Undoubtedly, this is painful, but as light pours into a dark place, don't shut your eyes or refuse to see. Educate yourself on the plight of the abused. Read the report. Learn to help. Some will be tempted to say this is just a few bad apples, or most of that was in the past. Humility requires us to honestly admit we have no clue how much of this continues now. This report, limited in scope, is the first word on abuse in our convention, not the last. We cannot continue to miss warnings, and we must learn humility and stop pretending that this is overblown. Folks, don't think for a second that sin is a minor issue. Don't think that there aren't people in our church, people that you know, people that you do Bible study with, people that you eat dinner with, people in your family, people that you've known for years. Don't think for a second that they are not struggling with sin because I promise you they are. I think about the sins of Israel in context here, right? Open shame is, abo- open shame is upon them because of their sins. Jerusalem lays desolate. They are in exile. That is embarrassing. This is once the nation that God parted the Red Seas to move out of Egypt. The man who's considered the richest and wisest king of all time and all of history, Solomon, and all of his kingdom is gone. The temple that he built, destroyed. Why? Because they perverted justice. They turned to idols. They neglected the oppressed. The list goes on and on. All you can see, you can see all of these things in the Old Testament books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. They were issues that were addressed by prophets, both major and minor, that have led the northern kingdom to be wiped out and the southern kingdom to be sent into exile. They've led Jerusalem, the earthly city of Zion, becoming desolate to the temple, the very earthly dwelling place that God chose to set up being destroyed. It's a total embarrassment for the people of God. Why? Because their sin had been uncovered for what it was, a transgression against God himself. Folks, sin is shameful, and we want to cover it up and hide it. We like Adam and Eve. We want to go hide because we know we've done something wrong. We want our sins to be between us and God and nobody else, so we hide them from the world. We cover them up with little white lies, which are in and of themselves as sinful as the things that we have to I'm preaching to myself, sorry. Here's the good news. Our sins are shameful, yes, but Jesus took that shame upon himself. He was hoisted up and beaten and mocked and scorned and took the shame of our sins upon himself. His glorious, perfect, holy, sinless self took it all on and nailed it to a tree. What is there left to keep covered up? You can boldly confess your sins and your shortcomings and your need for salvation because Jesus knew that need and he came to meet it. 
He emptied himself of his glory and became like you and I to be able to take those sins and shortcomings and save us from them by dying for them. He didn't have to do that, but he chose to do that. If half of your sinful thoughts were made known to the world, would you blush? To the Romans, Paul writes, For we will stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. See, there is a day when everything's going to be uncovered and everybody's going to know everything publicly. There is a reason that Paul writes that he boasts gladly about his weaknesses because Christ's power is perfected in weakness. If you, when you readily admit that you're not perfect, when you readily admit that you're not perfect, that you need help, you allow God to help you. And you proclaim to the world that God helps those, not who help themselves, but who cry out to him for help. And that's what this prayer is about, isn't it? Daniel makes known over and over that man, uh, that to man belongs sinfulness and to God belongs righteousness. But also, to man belongs condemnation and to God belongs mercy. Daniel's prayer is hard to read because it's owning his sins. He's saying back to God, we're in Babylon because you told us what to do and we messed it up. We blew it. You gave us opportunity after opportunity to turn back and we didn't take it. You sent us messenger after messenger, warning after warning, calamity after calamity, and we still chose to be disobedient. We ignored all of it. But at the same time, in Daniel's prayer, there's this amazing promise, the amazing moment. Daniel highlights God's goodness and power and deliverance that he has produced in the past. Picking up at the end of verse 14. He says, For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself... As at this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city of Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. He says the Lord is righteous in all the works that he's done, both in blessing and in discipline. God is still righteous in those things. God powerfully brought his people up out of Egypt. God made a name for himself. God's glory had people quaking in their boots when the Israelites crossed into the promised land. Think about Rahab. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God of heavens above and on the earth beneath. It's not because the Israelites were great. But because the Lord your God is in the heavens. The one in charge. The one who's brought victory for his own great name's sake this is the one to whom daniel pleads listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy for your own sake O lord make your face to shine upon your sanctuary which is desolate oh my god incline your ear and hear open our eye open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name for we do not present <clears throat> our pleas before you because of our righteousness but because of your great Mercy, it's not about Daniel's righteousness or the goodness of the nation or the repentant hearts of the people. The plea is based solely on God's mercy and God's goodness and God's reputation. Why? Because God is those things. Because he is merciful, because he is gracious, because he is great, because he is powerful, because he is holy. Daniel isn't dependent on some Israelite turnaround. He's not saying, hey, look at us, we got it right. See? 
He doesn't bring a broken offering to God and say, here, accept this on our behalf. It's the best we can do. He doesn't come with anything in his hand except the acknowledgement that there is nothing in his hand. I can offer you nothing. That to me and all of us belong sin and shame. And he begs God to intervene because God is merciful, because God is good, because God has shown himself to be that. He has given them the law so that they know that they need to look outside of themselves for deliverance, for provision and protection. He knows that God is listening and attentive to his people who cry out earnestly for his intervention. You know why? Because the scriptures tell him that. Because the history of the Israelite people say that when people turn their face to God in genuine repentance, God is faithful to hear them. It's how God has operated from the beginning of time, making provision for his people to find their way back to him. It's something that he's, that as David, as Dan, excuse me, as Daniel has had these terrifying visions over and over again as they're unfolding in front of him in, in the past couple of chapters, these interpretations that have come to help him to see that there's a plan in the midst of everything, that there is a future, and that future will result in the Son of Man. The righteous and holy one being given authority to reign and rule over everything forever. Now on the other side of the cross, on the other side of the cross, right? This was before Jesus. We know that the one who had the appearance of a man to whom the Ancient of Days installed on the throne, as we see in chapter 7, we know that that's Jesus. And so now we, like Daniel, are waiting for the next thing to take place. Daniel patiently awaited God to do what he promised to do, particularly as the Israelites were drawing near to the end of their 70 years of exile. He sought God's face eagerly, the same way we eagerly await Jesus' second coming, because he told us he was coming back. And so we look for it, we, we beg for it, we yearn for it, because we know what it will mean. It will mean that we get to spend an eternity, the rest of time with our Savior, forever and ever. Amen. And so Daniel prays to God, confessing the sins of his people, and he petitions him because God is good, and God is faithful, and God is all about glorifying himself on the earth. Where else can he go with his request? But to the one has proven time and time again to be sovereign over the nations, who has told him what will happen in the future. Who is, during Daniel's day and even now, still presently executing his plan to bring all the nations to his throne so that at the name of his son Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess on the earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this is God's plan, and he is going to be faithful to carry it out. And so in the meantime, we continue to confess our need, and we continue to trust in his righteousness, because that's all we can do. We intercede on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we commit ourselves to being found trusting in God 100%. In these days when everything seems to be falling apart, this is how we demonstrate that God is worth following. By loving those who are around us, loving those who are in the body of Christ, displaying the gospel, living it out, showing that, hey, you're a sinner, and not going, ah, you sinner, going, ah, you sinner. Let's pray about that. Let's figure out how we can get out of that pattern. Let's work through that. What does God say about your sin? What's a plan you can take? See, we we don't have to worry about what God's going to do. Because he's going to do it. In his timing. Not your timing. Not my timing. Not anybody else's timing, in his timing. So we continue to trust. 
We demonstrate to the world that we're dedicated to following God by trusting in Him. Not relying on our own strength or our own righteousness, but confessing our own inability to do anything right (laughs) apart from God. And by helping other people see that same thing. Let's pray like Daniel. Let's have this attitude. Let's say, God, we here at New Life Baptist Church, we've kind of blown it. We've done our best, but we know we're, we're still falling short. That's not easy for me to say. Because we are doing our best. Thankfully, we have a God who doesn't care about our best. He cares about his son's best. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you have made very plain and clear in your word what it looks like to follow after you. What it means to trust you wholeheartedly. What it means to dedicate ourselves to you. So Father, would you shape us into that? Would you crack open our hearts? God, would you put us in relationships with people? It doesn't have to be everybody, but with one or two with whom we can be really open and honest about, about who we are, about the things that we struggle with. Father, we need each other to be conformed to the image of Christ. We're part of a body. We don't get to be free agents. You didn't design it that way. Father, guide us and direct us as we go from here, as we consider the things that are going on in the world around us, as we try and be a light in dark places. Help us to remember that first and foremost, first and foremost, it's all in your hands. Father, give us an audience with people so that they would be willing to hear. Give us boldness to speak truth and begin softening hearts so that when we share the answer that we know is is there, when we share the truth, that people will begin to hear it and their lives will begin to be transformed by it. Father, I love you. I pray that in the coming days that you would Bring comfort to those who are in need of comfort and bring wisdom to all of us as we we engage a watching world. I ask this in the name, above all names, the name of your son, Jesus, for your great kingdom's sake. Amen.